60 days, 24 states, 20 activists, one Asian American. In the summer of 2018, I was a member of March for Our Lives nationwide youth civic engagement tour, Road to Change. I hopped on a bus from Houston, Texas, went all the way to Oakland, California, speaking with survivors of gun violence and youth doing amazing work within their own communities, as well as speaking on panels about gun violence prevention and youth civic engagement. It was one of the most transformative and life-changing moments of my life, yet it was also one of the most difficult. Not only was it difficult, because I was talking about gun violence every single day in nearly every single one of my conversations, but being the only Asian American identifying person on that tour also proved to be a challenge. This challenge culminated in one night. I was in a hotel room with all of my friends, and at this point, we had gotten to know each other pretty well. We were hanging out, having a good time, until two of my friends started making fun of another guy's feet. They were joking around, saying stuff like, why do they look like that? Until he got angry and suddenly it wasn't a joke. He looked at them and yelled, well, I'm sorry the Ching Chong lady messed up my feet. The room went silent and I was to say the least shocked. This was supposed to be a safe space. Meaning this was supposed to be a space where something like that should not have been said, but it was. And I am lucky enough to be in places where young people are doing incredible things, places where change is happening. But I learned to stop being grateful for simply having the opportunity to gain a platform and to start getting comfortable with critiquing the spaces I am in as a member of a movement and as an Asian American. Through this, I hope to prevent things like what happened to me from happening in other organizing experiences, as well as to encourage people in my community to show up and be active members of change. Looking back at my experiences and at the microaggressions I encountered on that tour and in other progressive spaces, I realized that the core issue was less about representation and more about the overall lack of education and a need to make fundamental changes within society. In short, there were several reasons as to why I was the only Asian American on that tour, and many of them were years in the making. I am a big believer in learning from the past but we need to make a point at learning history that isn't Eurocentric or whitewashed. How many of you remember learning about a significant Asian American figure in your textbook? Or about the lived experiences of Japanese internees? I wouldn't be surprised if nothing came to mind. Not many countries like to disseminate information about the atrocities they've committed to other groups of people. For example, when I was a junior in high school learning about World War II, I remember learning a lot about the triumphs of the Allied powers and the horrors committed by the Axis powers. We then spent maybe one or two slides, not days, slides, on the internment of Japanese people. Sugarcoating history is not a novel thing especially in Texas history classes. Did you know that the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, also known as TEKS, requires 0% of its content to include Asian Americans? I didn't learn the story of Vincent Chin, a Chinese American man who was brutally murdered by two white men over their frustrations of the success of the Japanese auto industry, or about Yuri Kochiyama, a Japanese American internee and civil rights activist. I didn't learn that the term Asian American came from radical roots to fight racism, imperialism, and degrading politics. I didn't learn any of this until I came to UT and took an intro to Asian American studies course this past spring. But these stories, the stories of Asian American people, places, and events 
matters. Telling them helps break monolithic stereotypes and barriers put up internally and externally to prevent Asian Americans from being civically engaged, like being a part of nonprofits, which are traditionally white spaces. It took a while for March for Our Lives to get where it is now, and the organization is still evolving, learning, and growing. Through this process, I got to see the impact of relearning history firsthand. In April, I led a virtual March for Our Lives workshop about xenophobia and explained how anti-Asian sentiment did not begin with COVID-19. After talking about the perpetual foreigner stereotype, as well as the model minority racial project and the story of Vincent Chin, all the participants were put into breakout rooms to process and divulge the content. Many of them expressed how this was their first time learning any of this. And one person even cried, feeling guilty as to how little she knew about Asian American history before my short seminar. Now, I'm not here to make anyone feel guilty. I frankly don't want your guilt. But I do think it's okay to make people feel uncomfortable. Facing that discomfort and trying to understand why something makes you uncomfortable is how we start to unlearn and dismantle the sugar-coated version of this world we were taught in schools. This process of unlearning and learning is an important facet of becoming more involved with organizing and civic engagement. And it's something that Asian Americans must do with ourselves, within our communities, and we're discussing our place in this country. Many of you may have heard that Asian people don't vote because we don't have to. We don't have to be civically engaged since we are the model minority. We are successful, driven, crazy rich. These stereotypes could not be more wrong. Asia is comprised of 48 different countries. But in the United States, those 48 countries are compressed into one label called Asian American. Grouping the Asian American experience as one model minority trivializes and undermines the individual struggles and experiences that each Asian American has to go through. In the United States, Southeast Asian Americans have the lowest high school graduation and bachelor degree rates. Furthermore, 13% of Asian Americans, this includes East Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian, live in poverty. The White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders also did a study that showed that this demographic is the least likely to get healthcare. So reducing the Asian American experience allows for complacency by lawmakers when they write education or healthcare policy and hurts the community as a whole. Are there successful Asian Americans? Of course, there are many in fact who benefit from and lean into the model minority myth to gain proximity to whiteness. But Asian Americans, especially those with lighter complexions, must remember that we will never be white and we will never attain white privilege. In turn, we must recognize how we can perpetuate anti-blackness and white supremacy so that we can achieve our collective liberation. A part of the reason why it seems like Asian people aren't civically engaged or part of large movements is because this work requires community and partnership. But there is a valid distrust of the Asian American community. The story of Richard Aoki is a good example. Richard Aoki is an Asian American who has garnered attention and recognition for his work with the Black Panther Party. He became a figure of solidarity of Black and Asian co-organizing efforts. But in 2012, it was revealed that he was actually tasked to be an FBI informant and was giving critical information about the Black Panther Party to the FBI. This is appalling. The only Asian American with a leadership position in the Black Panther Party was actually actively working to dismantle it. And this president has presented itself today. At the beginning of the coronavirus outbreak, 
It seemed like assaults against East Asian people were rising more than the illness did itself in the US. But when I saw Asian Americans post about these attacks and condemning them, they would end their comments with things like, why don't y'all rally for Asian Americans the same way you do other people of color? But we need to stop doing this and stop playing oppression Olympics. Other minorities don't owe us anything. In fact, other Black, Indigenous, people of color have shown up for us time and time again through the anti-Vietnam War protests, helping increase access to immigration, and more. So this is my reminder that Asian Americans, we must not only rally to our own causes. I would see tweets from Asian American youth talking about the coronavirus doesn't give you an excuse to be racist to Asian people, but two tweets before that would have the N-word in it. We are stronger together than we are apart, so Asian Americans must not be afraid to hold each other accountable and to be in solidarity with others. There are people who did this and did this well, like Yuri Kochiyama, who I mentioned earlier, who was a prominent civil rights activist and one of Malcolm X's closest confidants, or Grace Lee Boggs, who worked her entire life to alleviate poverty in Detroit's communities with methods like mutual aid. Their activism was beyond themselves, and this is something I had to learn as well. By learning from and working with non-Asian organizers, I became a better organizer and person. Going back to that night, I heard the words Ching Chong lady ring through the hotel room. I didn't think I had this voice. I didn't know how to critique someone in a powerful and progressive space because I assumed everyone knew better. So that night I opened my mouth, expecting the best comeback in the world to come out, but nothing. But people aren't perfect. And we grew up in a racist and prejudiced country that doesn't easily give us the tools to dismantle this thinking. So I left the room and I thought a lot about the reason I was there. I joined March for Our Lives because of the cause, because of the issue of gun violence and the passion I have to end it. And even though I was the only Asian American on that tour, I wasn't alone. Those two friends from earlier had my back and helped me hold that person accountable. The conversation wasn't easy, but it was one of the first times that I had to confront the idea that no place is perfect and it's okay to continue relearning and learning. Moving forward, I will not be the token Asian. I cannot represent 48 different countries as a Korean American, but I will continue to critique the spaces I am in and be a critical thinker. And ask myself, what does a safe space look like? What does that mean for the youth organizing community, the Asian American community, for BIPOC solidarity, and for our collective liberation? But I will continue to reimagine the spaces I am in, and I encourage and challenge you to do the same. Thank you.